And when you know what God wants, you see our ministry at this moment lives and dies in the prayer room. Mm -hmm. It was Arthur Matthews who said, the history of a ministry is written in its prayer life. And our sense is we go where God tells us to go. We don't go unless God tells us to go. We don't go until God tells us to go. But when he tells us to go, we do not hesitate, not even for a moment. Right now, we are in a moment, a strategic moment where everything can change. We just need 50 right. million hand grenades. <laughs> there you had to go. This is what I love about you, man. You do your homework. <laughs> well, we got to hear about it. We got to hear about this. It's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I'm, I'm writing a book right now um, about unlocking the armory of God and taking stories from history and warfare in the past and, and showing how we can pray and apply it. And when I heard your story about 50 million hand grenades, I said, Dad, go on it. He had to get there first, didn't he? 50 yep. million hand grenades. What a story. Tell us about that. Okay. Fla Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for reelection by attacking four men. Uh, one was Boeing, mm -hmm. which we now know as Boeing Aircraft. The other is Henry J. Kaiser, the F Henry Ford, and Pierre DuPont. Now, these four men were the titans of American business at the time. And he felt that he had a populist message that if he insulted them, and he, and he exposed them as all being crooks and dishonest, that he could win, and sure enough, he did. Then December 7th happened. And on December 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, hmm. and five days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. So we had a war on the in the East and a war in the West, and we had to build the American war machine to defend freedom. And he had to sit with four men that he had alienated that hated him <laughs> and that were all waiting to just let him know exactly how they felt. And he had to give the speech of his life. And that is the speech that I feel that I am crisscrossing America giving mm -hmm. right now to some of the most important Christian leaders. And what he said to them is this, why wouldn't you build these machines that we need? Why wouldn't you do it? And they said, because we have to protect our business and our grandchildren. And he looked at him and he said, you're not going to have a business or freedom from your grandchildren unless we destroy this evil. That same moment, and I, I'm going to get back to what they did. That moment is on you and I right now. That yes. moment when Christian leaders have got to forget that they're Assembly of God, Foursquare, mm -hmm. Baptist, Methodist, they're Americans. The Democratic Party has made it exceedingly clear that their target is the church and their target is our morality and our children. They have done everything in their power. Nobody could have said it better than the congressman in Texas who recently shifted from being Democrat to Republican. He said the idea of defunding the police is insanity. The idea of destroying the oil industry is insanity. What's happening in the southern border is insanity. And the debt that they've just heaped on us is inexcusable. So now we must build the American revival machine. Mm. We must unify. And so Pierre DuPont, who had built the Empire State Building and took over General Motors, was going through a line when the scientists of the U.S. Army were showing him the newest hand grenade they were going to use in World War II. And he asked them, how many of these do you need? And he looked at Pierre DuPont and he said, 50 million. <laughs> That's how many we need. Well, listen, he went ahead and the soberness of it gripped him. And what we need now is not church as usual. We don't mm. need another Sunday morning. You, pastor, have got to lose your insecurity about church attendance and marketing yourself and trying to get members. You've got to save a nation. You've got to save a country. And it begins in your pulpit.
It begins by repenting. Let me give you a, a, a sample sermon right now. I want all of you in my church to know that I've been a yellow-bellied hmm. coward and that I have stood here and given you all sorts of excuses and diversions, and I can't do it anymore. I can't live with myself. I've got to tell you that marriage must be restored. Yes. I've got to tell you that American freedom and American constitution must be defended. And I'm going to do everything in my power to oppose any school board that is trying to teach us racism or alternative lifestyles or put a man in my little girl's bathroom hmm. at school. I'm against it. I'm going to fight it. And as long as we use the excuse that this, you know, if I start speaking that way, I'm going to lose members. If you don't speak out, Pastor, you're going to lose your whole church. Yeah. You're going to lose your right to even meet. And if you sit there and say, oh, it's not that, it's not real. That's exactly going back to FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt told these boys, look, if you don't act, none of this is going to be here. There's going to be no Boeing, General Motors, Kaiser Aluminum. There's not going to be any DuPont Chemical or General Motors. It's not going to be here. America's not going to be here. Same way. And so here's what Henry Ford did. He built a factory that could construct a B-25 bomber every 60 minutes. We, Henry Kaiser found a way to build battleships where every day in San Francisco Bay, raw metal would begin in the morning and by that evening, a Liberty ship is sailing out of the wow. Golden Gate Bridge, loaded with ammunition and food and medicine for soldiers. And the best one of all was Boeing, who ended up building 8,700 aircraft, bombers and fighter planes. It was an astonishing moment in American history. And we're at that moment right now. We have got to build the American w revival machine. And we've got to quit th thinking that we can all be divided and separated from each other and let this thing happen. No, it's time. We had an election stolen. We had a pandemic foisted on us. Mm -hmm. I love a, a little country song that just came out from Gary Chapman that it goes like this. He took the old Johnny Paycheck song and rewrote the words. And it's take this jab and shove it. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, I just think it's an, it's an amazing moment. And if the people are ahead of the pastors, how embarrassing is that? Wow. I think a lot of pastors are at our place right now. As you were talking, I was reminded of something that you had written a long time ago where you said you had to repent for the misplaced courtesy you had been showing the devil. I can't tell you how important that statement is. Yeah. You know, I, I really believe that that pastors and leaders are depressed and they don't realize that that depression, that weariness, that discouragement is an attack of Satan that they've got to neutralize by the authority of the cross and the blood, that they've got to do that today. They've got to realize I'm not just overworked. I'm not just uh, fighting division in my church or not knowing what to do in, with all these new laws. No, you're fighting a spiritual depression and a weariness of heart. And you've got to, the Bible says that we take that authority by the action of the cross on the ground of the cross. And it will leave you. It will lift off of you. And you know what's going to do? It's going to be replaced by an excitement. Is my task impossible in the natural? Yes, it is. Am I daily assaulted by criticism from all directions? Yes, I am. Is there not in my life a regular moment where I have to believe God for hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions in some cases in order to keep the forward motion of the great movement that I'm a part of? Yes, it's true. So if I have the drain of that, the drain of the criticism, the drain of the opposition, 
the drain of the disappointment of cowardly preachers. Why do I have so much joy and peace? Because I'm living off of a fuel that is supernatural. I'm not relying on my human temperament in order to get the job done. I'm in the closet of prayer. I'm, I'm sold out, on fire, drained, dead to self, living under the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful place to be and how ridiculous it makes everything look. Well, it's, and somebody may be saying, why are we tying all of this together? Because healing comes from hatred. Healing, the power to heal comes from hatred. I learned that from you. What does that mean? The verse says, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, therefore the Lord has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your brethren. Jesus attacked sickness. It was, and, and it's interesting that he read those verses in Luke chapter four, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news. And then he listed the uh, set the prisoner free to open the eyes of the blind. And he listed this, the miracles that he would do in fulfilling the precise words of Isaiah. And at the end of that list of verses, the words appear, the year of the vengeance of our God. Mm. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God. First John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God revealed that he might destroy the works of the devil. He went about doing good, Acts 10, 38, healing all who were oppressed of Satan, for God was with him. Christ had a, what they call in the military, the, the most intense attack there is, is this phrase, attack with extreme prejudice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's exactly how Christ felt about sickness. And that, that's the way I feel about it. When I go into a tent and I see what the devil has done to people's bodies, mm. I am filled with a divine vengeance, vengeance to set them free in Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because, because is the most important word in that statement. What's, what's that mean? There's an, there's an assignment there, isn't there? Yes. And when you know what God wants, you see our ministry at this moment lives and dies in the prayer room. Hmm. It was Arthur Matthews who said, the history of a ministry is written in its prayer life. And our sense is we go where God tells us to go. We don't go unless God tells us to go. We don't go until God tells us to go. But when he tells us to go, we do not hesitate, not even for a moment. Hmm. Because is the powerful word there. I think that men of God fail. Men and women of God fail because they go from obeying God to sustaining their success. Ah. And they forget why they were anointed in the first place. And like I, I say this all the time, uh, celebrity, right now, people are, that have never heard of me are suddenly hearing about me in different places. And they say, man, you just came out of nowhere. And I tell them, yeah, I'm a 50 year <laughs> overnight success. Hmm. And, uh, and I, I look at them and I say, you know what? This visibility, celebrity, and influence are a line of credit to be exhausted in the act of telling the truth. And the minute you go from telling the truth to trying to extend your line of credit by hiring handlers, spin doctors, and marketing yourself, the greatest disaster of the hour we're in is self-promotion. And self-promotion is so pervasive that you can get a, a Facebook page. You can uh, write out a prophetic utterance. You can string together a quilt of statements that make you sound spiritual and fool a lot of people. But the devil is not impressed. He does not respect how many hits your YouTube channel takes. Yes. He doesn't respect 
the number of followers you have on Facebook. He only respects one thing, the anointing. And I'm, I don't care to be uh, liked and well-known in that arena. I want to be feared in hell. Hmm. And that is my goal. That is my obsession. I want the devil to fear me. I don't want people to like me.